Welcome into WRSC. Welcome into Five Things. This is Eric McKinney joined by Greg Katz and Mark Culkin. Uh, guys, we're here for the last time at the Coliseum uh, this season, and we are talking about another rough one at the Coliseum. Uh, UCLA wins 38 to 20 against a USC team that started the season 6 and 0 and then went 1 and 5. Uh, over what we had talked about before the year as a tough back half of the schedule. Don't think any of us had them at one and five, but that's the team, that's the program that USC is right now with a bowl game left and then going into what feels like just an absolutely monumental offseason for Lincoln Riley and the Trojans. Let's get into to five things. Our first thing from this one is the player of the game uh, Greg, I, I don't know how much you're going to have to stretch on this or, or go ahead and, and pick one of those visitors, uh, your player of the game in this one. Well, I'm copying out. I'm picking the coach of the game. I'm going with UCLA uh, defensive coordinator, Anton Lynn. Uh, I thought Hold he, on, give, give him, give, put the D in it. Danton Lynn, right? Make sure the D cause that, <laughs> that defense is, it, it deserves it today. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, it, it's a two-prong deal, and, and I'll get to the second prong in the next question of five things. But, you know, they were the top defense in the Pac-12. But, you know what? Lincoln Riley's been having problems for several games on trying to un unleash the offense, which is, in the words of uh, the great Mark Culkin, lost its identity, Right. I don't know what they're doing uh, and some of the decisions being made, but I'm sorry. Uh, they, Lynn was fantastic as a defensive coordinator. SC will be very fortunate if they can get somebody on that and that level. In fact, you know, I mean, I, I think the guy will be back in the NFL. He's really, you know, making, making his, his hay here, but what he did against, uh, especially I watched what they were doing up front. You know, they were pretty much hemming in uh, as well as you can against Caleb Williams. And the way they had their sets to contain him and knew what he was going to do, it's impossible to actually totally stop him. But my my player of the game is the coach of the game. And the players, I guess, is the UCLA defense. If you got to nail me to just players. Mark, go ahead. Your, your maybe interpretation of <laughs> player of the game in this one. Well, because we have to name a player, and I refuse to name a UCLA player as a player of the game, um, I'm just looking at stats. So, Brendan Rice, you are the winner behind door number two. <laughs> Eight catches, 147 yards, and a touchdown. And that one touchdown, I can promise you that wasn't how they drew it up in the huddle. But we'll take it, and that was your player of the game. All right, uh, I'm going with a, a mix. I'm going to go player like Mark, but I'm going to go Bruin like Greg did. And it's it's anyone who weighs more than 250 pounds, I think, in a UCLA uniform. That the lines, offensive line, defensive line for UCLA <laughs> came to play in this one and they they dominated the line of scrimmage and and that's it usc talks a lot about you know we didn't execute out here and we've got to make this play and that play and sometimes you just have to snap the ball and run somebody over or push somebody around and that's what it felt like ucla was able to do in this one on on both sides uh they ran for 199 yards uh, in this one and I thought it was telling at the end of the game again it, it's over and and it's maybe not competitive at that point they wanted to run out the clock and they just ran it right you they, they ran for a first down USC at no point in the game with everything open to them could get anything going on the ground and and that was so so significant in this one and and we knew coming in if UCLA can run the ball and USC can't, that's going to swing things dramatically towards UCLA. And, and that's absolutely what ended up happening. So the, the big guys for UCLA, for, for me, won this one. Let's go to the play of the game. Greg, we're going to go back to you. Second thing here, your play of the game from this one. 
I thought the play of the game for me was the most ridiculous, stupid uh, decision by Lincoln Riley on fourth down uh, in the first quarter to go for it. And they got stoned uh, by, we already know that UCLA had a, an excellent front seven, right? So let's test it early in the game so that if we don't get it, we'll give them the ball in good territory and they're going to ram it right down our throat and, and score. To me, that changed the whole mindset of the game. UCLA got off on that and never gave up. And it's like USC went into like suspended animation on offense. And uh, shame on you, Lincoln Riley, for making that call. You get paid millions of dollars to not make a call like that. And you did it. And you got what you deserved. Uh, you know, you could easily say, well, you know, if they would have stopped him. But, you know, you don't want to give UCLA any chance to think that they can win this game, even if they think they can win the game. And I thought it was just, to me, it was the preface, if this was a book, of one of the most embarrassing losses in the history of USC football, uh, utterly embarrassing, uh, given what we know about USC and UCLA, even rivalry games. Mark, do you have a play that tops... One of, one of the most embarrassing plays in in USC history in the in this rivalry. Your your play of the game in this one. Well, I still think 2021 was probably the most embarrassing season in USC's history. So I don't know if we're gonna put, I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna categorize this one in that there. Uh, for me, the play of the game was the fumble, scoop and score. Uh, I, I think at that point, any thought that USC had of getting back into the game was pretty much kicked to the curb you know we were anticipating a weather being a factor weather never showed up but usc turned the ball over with a regularity uh what was it three fumbles four fumbles you had another you had caleb williams interception it, i'll stick to that play that was the play of the game you it just happened there's never a good time but if you're looking for the most inopportune time probably right there all right, I've I've got a ton. I've got a ton because I, I think it's a I think it's a series. I think I think there's two series for me, and it's at the beginning of both halves. First of all, for UCLA to win the toss and kick, I think tells you maybe what people think at this point about this USC offense, and certainly the statement UCLA wanted to make early. That goes into what Greg talked about that fourth down call that that USC ran it a couple times early and clearly could do nothing. Also early on when UCLA rips the ball out of Brendan Rice's hands, uh, so much of this was just end up ended up being foreshadowing for what you saw the rest of the game. Sloppy ball handling, not able to run the ball. And then UCLA gets it on that short field and just runs it straight down the field, straight in, touchdown. And that was just a worst case scenario for you. USC you thought okay they can kind of get their balance and and come back and it just never did and I thought the start of the third quarter was the same UCLA gets the ball they convert they go five for five on third downs on that and they score a touchdown on a third down play and again it just was it, it, that was the whole game that was the whole game this is not a good UCLA offense and it felt like, yeah, there were some three and outs for them, uh, but but it felt like, especially on third down, they were just in full control of everything they wanted to do on offense and defense against USC in this one. And and it was it was a rough watch for the whole time. Let, let's go to our third thing, Greg. Uh, the expectation you had maybe coming into this one uh, that that you saw play out here. Well, my expectations was is that the team that wanted it the most was probably going to come out and win the game. I thought that USC would come out strong because I felt they had a lot to gain just in the fact that it's UCLA, right? Uh, you you said to yourself, well, look, they could play in a better bowl game maybe. Uh, they had reasons to say, look, we've got a full house. We're on national television. we got a boatload of recruits here. So my expectations is they would come out to play and uh, you know, maybe they thought they were playing hard, 
but it certainly looked like UCLA was playing much harder. Let's put it that way. So, so, so Greg can't go expectation met because this game was, was that frustrating. Mark, Mark, your expectation that you saw play out in this one. So going into this season, I had no idea who Francisco Mendoza was. I had no idea who Bryson Barnes was. My expectation was USC's defense, even though it showed a slight bit of improvement last week against Oregon, would again make another poor quarterback look great. By the way, Ethan Garbers had a career high, three touchdowns on this in this game. Shocking. Expectation met. You want to look good? You put USC's defense on the other side of the field and you will look great. Expectation met. I, I like that Fernando Mendoza is still Francisco Mendoza. <laughs> I still don't know his name. I, I think it makes the point, right, of, of if you just suit up, you can probably put up some numbers uh, against this defense. You're correct me, Eric. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, it's seriously. I should, the only, I it's the nice only reason that I'm here. Don't get uh, it wrong, Eric. <laughs> so so my expectation was it was a very very small one and that it was USC would get some sacks against UCLA and it would they they got 3 uh but that's really the only thing that I saw coming in this maybe a little bit that the running game would be challenged against UCLA but I certainly would not have guessed that they would rush for 3 yards uh in this game so I can't say I can't say my expectation what is that it would struggle that much? So so that's it for me, is that the USC defense, which had, I believe, two sacks in its last five games, would get at least that many against UCLA, and they got three. And boy, was it too little, too late, and just absolutely not enough defensively in this one. Let's spin it forward. We're going to go uh, to, the, to the fourth thing here, Greg, and that's your surprise I'm assuming we could go for a while on this one, but you're, you're surprised. Uh, well, I know Mark wants to go eat later, so I'm going to cut mine a little bit shorter. Um, I think the surprise for me is that they could only score two scrimmage touchdowns in four quarters. Now, granted, UCLA played great on defense. They played great. But you've got Caleb Williams, the overall best player in college football, and you can only manufacture two touchdowns and the rest are field goals and one of them was missed. That was shocking, surprising to me. Uh, with just him alone, there's no way that SC... I did. what are we supposed to think? That if SC continues to play poor teams like Nevada and San Jose State, they'll lead the country in scoring offense? Like you pointed out, look what happened in the last uh, second half of the season. Look what the the adjustments on defense made. So my surprise, bottom line, they could only score two scrimmage touchdowns. And the second one, in my opinion, was cosmetic. Mark, you're surprised from this one. Probably can go into the into the takeaway as well. But my surprise is that the offense has, and, and Greg, you thank you for the kudos, but 12 games in the season. If this team didn't have Caleb Williams, this team has zero identity on either side of the ball. I'm just really surprised. Beginning of the year, during the offseason, spring camp, the longer we go, the better we get. The longer this thing went, the worse this program became. <laughs> there was no development. We were not close. None. Any capacity. I don't care how many times Lincoln Riley believes if a couple plays goes this way and a couple plays go that way, we're not feeling this way. I'm just surprised at the lack of awareness or if he is aware, the the constant, well, let's just go back to that same page and, and talk coach speak because you're losing credibility. And when you're in your second year of the program, coming off an 11 win season, I shouldn't have people who work at USC in this press box walking behind saying, bring back Clay Helton. That happened. That's not, hyper not exaggerating. That actually happened. My not, that I, here, not that I agree with that, but it did happen. We were there to hear it. My my surprise in this one is that USC just forgot to show up early. Just did just didn't come out of the tunnel. I mean, we, we I, I talked about that first series 
right? Like didn't have it up front and you're playing without Jared Kingston at right tackle. So there's a, a shuffle a little bit on the offensive line, but other than that, you've, you've got guys there. I mean, everyone's got injuries. Everyone's dealing with stuff at this point in the season. UCLA is, is trying to hustle guys off the bench to play quarterback for them at this point in the year. I mean, th this is what college football is at this point. And you went down 14-0 without really even a fight. And when you look at it now, that's UCLA and Notre Dame. You're down 38 to six. That's the run that those teams went on. 24 six in South Bend at halftime against Notre Dame, 14 0 quickly against UCLA. If you're only going to play two games during the year, play those two games. And then to come out with, again, you've, you've lost a lot of what you thought you had to play for early in the season coming into this game. You played eight games in a row, you've had some tough losses. Show up for this one. I mean, it, that that to me was surprising for a team that had fought, that had fought late into games throughout the year. You thought, okay, put it together here. It's the second week with the new defensive coordinator. If that gave you any shot in the arm, go ahead and show that here. That to me was surprising. The the start, not so much that they're they're they didn't execute, but just there was no, there felt like no passion, no emotion, nothing to it. And I think it's fair to, to ask in all of the, with, with all the transfer portal additions and so many players who maybe didn't grow up with this rivalry and just kind of how college football is now, you, you wonder how much passion there is. USC traditions, the rivalry, all of that. I think you, you you hear lip service given to it, but when that happens in in those two games, uh, in the same <laughs> season, it's that that that's a rough watch for USC fans. I think. Let's go to the fifth thing, and we'll wrap this up. and And this gives us our, I think, our biggest chance to spin this way forward with the biggest takeaway as our fifth thing. And now I, I know there's a bowl game. But this is the off season, right? Regular season's done. That that's the 2023 season. Let's spin this forward into the off season and moving forward for this program. Greg, your your biggest takeaway coming out of this game? Well, I think Lincoln Riley's credibility is at the bottom level at this point. He makes statements. I understand why he does them, but when they're in the late in the season, saying we we just a couple of tweaks here, a couple of tweaks there. I expect a big giant step on the defense this week. I expect that. When that stuff doesn't happen, that's credibility. Plus, because SC is such a storied name and big television market, they're on national TV probably more than some might be on it. And you keep dispensing these type of games. It's pretty hard to go out there and recruit. And the sad part really is, and I mean this sincerely, He's only in his second season, okay? Uh, and, okay, so they didn't go to the national championship. But to end it the way it's ending, uh, you know, I hindsight, I know it's 2020, but, you know, they didn't play Oregon or Washington last year. And just uh, assuming that they did and they lost those two games, they wouldn't have been in the, you know, in the Cotton Bowl. But then they go to the Cotton Bowl and they lose to Tulane. And now they're going to go to another bowl game. And who knows which bowl game uh, down the rung they're going to be in. Maybe the Holiday Bowl. You know, I, I don't think it's going to be the L.A. Bowl. Uh, but, you know, there, it's you know could be Texas El Paso. But Lincoln Riley is going to be brought up again. How What's his record in bowl games? This coach has a lot of ground to make up in credibility. You can only have talking points for so long before you start saying, you can shoot those down in a hurry. And believe me, the teams that recruit against SC, Oregon, Washington, even UCLA, they're going to go for the jugular. So there's a rehabilitation of credibility going forward that I think that Lincoln Riley's really got his work cut out for him. And had, had he not been in, only in his second year, if this was his fourth year or fifth year, making, what, uh, over $100 million or whatever he's making and living in the, the opulent uh, manner that he does, I don't think SC will stand for it at this point. And we're going to find out if that how much of that is true. Mark, your biggest takeaway here coming out of this one. So 
I'm just going to talk, take, do my takeaway on this game. And I'll, I'm sure we'll be doing a end of the season takeaway, but let's just be happy. Let, you Trojan fans, let, let's, let's be real honest here. If UCLA actually had a good quarterback, 38 to 20 is probably 56 to something. This team came out uninspired, unprepared, and not willing to play. I don't care what the players and what the coach says after the game. You got your ass handed to you by Notre Dame. You're not playing for the conference championship game. You're not going to the playoffs. And Caleb, you're not winning the Heisman. Where's your pride? You got to suck it up. You cannot show up for your last game of the year and fall flat on your face. I, this that That's a coaching problem. This team did not come ready to play. And when it's 14 nothing, yeah, you can start a little skirmish on the field, but you better, you know, you got to back it up. This team got pushed around. And we'll talk about pushed around. I, I think, Eric, you alluded to it. UCLA never rushed more than three guys. USC's offensive line has five guys. Well, you, you hope, you thought. They have had their way with USC. The, the lack of the a lack of effort. This team did not fight. We saw fight at the end of Oregon. You saw you saw them fight early in the game, early in the season. This game, I saw a team that didn't give an effort. Yeah, I I think for me, there's two. Uh, needing to get better on both lines of scrimmage is not not a surprise. I mean, that has been a USC staple talking point for years at this point uh it, it it is like sirens blaring red flags all over the place at this point on both those lines of scrimmage this offseason is gigantic and i think for for lincoln riley just in terms of the program you need a full scale rehabilitation and a, and a rethinking I think of everything. And, and I don't say that to say you just fire everybody and start over, but you you really need a purpose for every single thing that is here. I think like like Greg said, if you switch these schedules, right? You switch the schedules and they lose this many games easily last year, I think. That schedule last year was set up like USC just handpicked who they wanted to play and, and when they wanted to play. There was, there was one tough game on that schedule last year, and they lost it at Utah. This year was set up like someone from UCLA came through and set up USC's schedule in the toughest way. So these are two different things. You'd expect them to lose more games facing this schedule than last year's schedule. You guys hit at it, though. There are teams, Arizona, look at Arizona, right? Arizona feels like it's trending up, even when it plays good teams toward the end of the year, getting better, better, better. You see that from some teams. This team felt like it sort of, it ran out to whatever lead it had against Stanford in the first half of the third game of the season, and then just kind of cruise control, and we'll see what happens the rest of the year. And it never felt like there was any significant improvement literally at any position or group or side of the ball or anything from that point on. And, and that is going to take a deep dive this off season to figure out why they're here and, and why they're there. Lincoln Riley talked about a little bit at the end of this game. Look, if three plays go differently in some of those games and we win those games, which there are a couple plays that you can look at. There are a couple plays in games they won where it could go the other way and you could lose. But his point was, even if we win those games, we're not a better team than if we lost those games because of those plays. And I can understand that as long as he fully buys into the fact that, yeah, you could have lost more games. You could have been below 500 uh, this season, if if an onside kick gets recovered by Colorado, if Arizona does anything with kind of its its two point conversions and and wins that game, so facing looking at yourself in the mirror and figuring out how far you are away from where you want to be and what that's going to take, those are questions I don't think he's ever had to answer in his head coaching career. Certainly, it didn't feel like he had to at Oklahoma, and because of that schedule last year, 
got away with a little bit in, in terms of maybe what USC lacked last year. This year was the chickens coming home to roost, I think, in, in what this program he inherited really had kind of in, in its bones. And so we'll see what he does going forward. But it is uh, it it is going to be a monumental task, I think, to, to get it going. And it, it starts, for me at least, with those big guys up front and just – the ability to, to push people around. Can you get there? Can you get this program to the point where you don't need to make the perfect block on the outside on a wide receiver screen to get yards because you can just run somebody over and, and get a running game going against even a good defensive line, which clearly that was not the case here today against UCLA. So we'll be on the lookout for what bowl game they're attending who plays in that game, any other major decisions kind of coming out of, of this program here in the near future. But for now, uh, that's our five things look back at UCLA's 38-20 win against USC in the Coliseum. For Mark Culkin, for Greg Katz, this is Eric McKinney. Thanks for watching Five Things. Thanks for watching We Are SC.